right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned, I am Oriana, the Municipal Light Plant Coordinator for MCAN and Massachusetts Climate Action Network was founded in 2000. And we are a learning network of chapters across Massachusetts taking action to solve climate change. We have 50 chapters representing more than 70 cities and towns. And if you're not already a chapter, we would be happy to welcome your local group. We focus on climate solutions and we do everything from helping groups get climate friendly, friendly by laws passed through town meeting or city councils to giving you all a voice at the state level on policies and programs. Tonight's webinar is about how you can get involved locally if you're in a town served by one of the municipal electric utilities or how you can take action at the state house if you lived in an, in, in an investor owned utility or just know more about what's going on in uh, the state with these unique things called municipal light plants. All right. Um, so tonight's agenda, I just welcomed you all. Um, then we'll go over what exactly is a municipal light plant or an MLP. Because if you're not a seasoned activist, you might be wondering exactly what they are. Um, maybe if you've read our report, you have some idea. Um, and then we will go into the background. Why did we do this report on this kind of obscure and often ignored topic? What did we find out? What were the results? And then we'll go into how to use this report locally. And I'm very excited to say that we'll have two local light board members um, to share a little bit about how they're thinking of using the results of this report to improve policy in their town. And then we'll have ample time for a question and answer session um, that will be moderated again through the chat box. So municipal light plants, what are they? They are municipally owned electricity. Uh, you can see in this map here um, that the purple is served by National Grid. You might be familiar with them. You might get your electric bill from them. Eversource, that's where I get my electricity from. Um, I live in Boston. Or these pink things, which are the municipal electricity. So instead of Eversource or National Grid, you might get your bill from Wakefield Gas and Electric Department or Rowley's Municipal Lighting Plant. Um, they make up 14% of electricity sold in Massachusetts. So even though they are spread out um, kind of all over the place, and a lot of them are pretty small because they represent a town that's either in the suburbs or a smaller rural town in central mass. Um, altogether, they do make up a significant chunk of our electricity in the Commonwealth. Um, so what makes them unique? They're different from every source of national grid in that if you live in one of these territories, you could actually walk up to your, the manager of your utility and, and tell them what you want from your electric service. I know I definitely can't walk up to the CEO of Eversource. Um, I don't know who it is, don't know where they live. Um, yeah, I have no direct control. Um, and they are also nonprofit, so they're owned by the members, the residents, and customers of the towns that they serve. They're not owned by investors on Wall Street. Um, so their goal isn't really to make a profit. It's to serve their customers in whatever way their customers need to be served or want to be served. Um, they answer to elected or appointed officials. So 
there's about three different ways that their decision making can be structured. Um, either they report to the board of selectmen, the town manager, or the elected light board or the appointed light board. And they have um, unique possibility for innovation. There's a couple reasons for that. They have uh, possibilities for innovation because they don't have as much bureaucracy to get through as the uh, large investor-owned utilities might. Um, they just have their town-level government, and they can make a lot of decisions on their own pretty immediately. Um, additionally, since they're smaller, they could function as a microgrid if they so chose, um, if they built a lot of storage and a lot of generation within the town, and especially if they're one of the really small towns, they could um, act like a microgrid, which are becoming more popular these days. All right. So this matters to people in municipal light plant towns as well as people in the rest of the state. And um, sorry. Um, and even in the broader world. So that is because in Massachusetts, we currently have a collective goal of an 80% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2050. And really, if any of you have been paying attention to climate science, we actually know that's not good enough anymore. Our goal actually needs to be net zero emissions by 2030. Um, so... As Massachusetts, we've kind of been a leader in the country in the U.S. up until recently on, on climate policy and emissions policy. Um, I would say Hawaii and, and California are surpassing us on that now. Um, but, but still, in, in general, compared to a lot of places, we have been leading and um, meeting our greenhouse gas emissions reductions goals impact the rest of the world and how we're going to get there as a global community. And if you are an investor-owned utility customer, you should care about this. One, because you also live in Massachusetts and will be affected by climate change. And two, because um, municipal light plants should be part of the climate solution as well. If you're part of an investor-owned utility customer, you pay about a very small percentage, 0, 0, 0, 0.0005, to be part of the climate solution to the Renewable Energy Trust. Um, you also pay into the Mass Save Energy Efficiency Program, which we are well known for. Um, municipal light plant customers do not have to pay into any of that. Um, and are exempt from our clean energy laws, which is written about in more detail in the um, in the report. And I won't go into too much here unless we have questions at the end. But those are the clean energy standard and the renewable portfolio standard, um, which mandate a certain percent of electricity sold by the investor-owned utilities are renewable or qualify as clean, which is renewable with a bit of an expanded definition and includes some um, some hydro, which has a little bit larger life cycle emissions than solar and wind. Um, and if you're a municipal light plant customer, you should care because you have the opportunity to directly get involved with your electricity and make your municipal light plant better. And because you likely up until this point have actually not been receiving a lot of the benefits of energy efficiency and clean and renewable energy in your town that um, people and investor-owned utilities have. Um, but you can change that because you theoretically have direct control. Um, this report also illustrates, I would say, a couple implications for energy democracy and that concept that is my personal um, 
interest area, and I won't go too much into it here, but I'm happy to talk about it offline at any point. Um, I would say local energy democracy, this shows, this report shows that it has to fit in with our statewide dem democratic um, resolutions and policies as well. So why did we do this report? I would say it started out with doing it for the people in this photo. Um, this photo here is from our um, last Municipal Green Muni Action Summit with residents from municipal light plant towns. We had that at the end of January in Grafton, Massachusetts. We've had five of these over the past year and a half. And that's really how this all got started. We, as a network of local chapters doing local work, we had a couple groups who were in municipal light plant towns who were running into very specific issues um, surrounding clean energy and climate solutions that they were trying to achieve at the local level. And we also realized there was um, kind of a a lack of cohesive and centralized information. Um, people wanted to know what other municipal light plants were doing and what they could learn from what other municipal light plants were doing. And there, there had never been uh, a really standardized um, collection of a lot of information. And most people just didn't know. There wasn't anywhere to find it. Um, so, the goal of this report card was really to motivate and track positive change, to provide a benchmark, to say, okay, what, what exactly are they doing right now, um, to help municipal light plants and advocates prioritize their next step, um, and let's see, yeah, increase the amount of information uh, available to light plant advocates and others in the Commonwealth who care about this um, and provide examples of what works so that other municipal light plants can raise their score. So um, methods and scoring we use four primary categories and a bonus category to do this. Um, you can see in this lovely graph created by Applied Economics Clinic for us. Um, so clean energy was worth 40 points, 40%. 40 Nobody got the full 40 points, um, which I will go into in the key findings in a minute. Um, but I would say the two biggest, you can see here that the bonus points that had a maximum of 16 were kind of the reason for the top two scores being this high. Um, and then the second part that, um, that really added to that was the transparency section, I would say, transparency and leadership. So the biggest bonus category with 10 points allotted to it was being transparent and honest about what counts as renewable energy and what counts as non-emitting energy to their customers. Um, and I'll also go into that in a minute. And then the transparency section that made a big difference was whether the town and the light plant itself had a clean energy plan and clean energy goals with accountability to some to the um, the reporting agency of the municipal light plant manager. So key findings. If you've gotten a chance to look at any of the report, you might have seen this. Um, a major key finding was that municipal light plants were overstating their green content um, in order to be exempt from state regulations and to make their customers happy because uh, if 
there's there's one thing you can see from that a uh, um, a positive side is that customers must really want renewable energy and clean energy because uh, so many light plants are trying to claim it and brag about it to their customers that they provide clean energy to them. Um, they wouldn't do that if their customers didn't care. So they overstate their green content by um, one is kind of what qualifies as green. So none of the municipal light plants had enough renewable energy to meet the renewable portfolio standard in 2017. You can see here this is 12% was the standard of renewable energy as a percentage of electricity provided to customers. The highest scoring MLP, which was Belmont, had only 9% of that qualifying energy, which is wind, solar, small-scale hydro, and it has to be recently built. Um, and then the next two were at 7%. Um, most of the non-emitting energy that municipal you know, light plants claim and, and tell their customers as green or clean is old nuclear energy, um, which may or may not be a surprise to those of you listening. Uh, old nuclear generation is not current is not a source of clean energy that our clean energy standard or renewable portfolio standard class one or two accept. Um, mainly because it is old. So for the clean energy standard, nuclear would have to be built after 2010, and we hope that doesn't happen because we don't really want more nuclear pollution in our commonwealth, from NCAN's perspective, at least. Um, kilowatt hour sales. So the energy efficiency was... Um, very low. So we, you'll see a little bit later who got, who was doing slightly better on energy efficiency. There are some best practices there that could improve it. Um, but overall, it was really, really low um, effectiveness on the energy efficiency programs. You can see Unitil, which is the smallest investor-owned utility um, and is the same size as some of the larger municipal light plants, got at least 1.5% kilowatt hour savings. The um, highest scoring MLP was a little bit below half a percent, and then it dropped significantly here, and it dropped basically to zero after that. And the Next um, big key finding, oh, so here is the nuclear, the nuclear generation. So I didn't make a separate um, bar graph for 2017 just because of capacity in our very small nonprofit. But this red is all the nuclear, the old nuclear generation. And honestly, the bar graph hasn't changed that much except for a couple of these would have some more green, a um, little bit more green over here. But the, as a total percentage of non-emitting energy that is claimed by municipal light plants in 2017, 71% at least was from nuclear. I did that calculation the other day. Um, so... The third point in our key findings, at least 16 municipal light plants obscure or misrepresent information about how much clean energy they're actually providing to their customers. That means they're reporting differently to the Department of Environmental Protection than they are to their customers because they know what counts as renewable and non-emitting, but they, um, they don't want their customers to know what counts. So that primarily is about the issue of selling renewable energy certificates. Um, you can find out more about renewable energy certificates on our website. I will drop that link in the follow-up email. Um, it's under Learn the Facts on our website. But basically, so this is an example of a positive. 
So there were only three municipal life plans who, in some public publication, accurately described renewable energy certificates and non-emitting energy when we did our research. Um, only one of them really had this level of explanation, which should really serve as a model for other um, flight plants wanting to get those 10 bonus points and increase their transparency. As you can see, this gray portion is the null renewables. So um, they're, they're selling the RECs to the investor-owned utilities so the investor-owned utilities can meet the renewable portfolio standard. So this is basically just switched out with the average grid mix. I mean, this, yeah. What this means is that Belmont could, this is from Belmont's website, Belmont could easily retire a portion of these RECs and just zoom could get up to like 6% extra renewable energy with a very easy, simple flick of paper that, um, yeah, doesn't require selling new generation, doing any new fancy contracts. Very simple. This hydro, so the reason, if you're wondering, um, this hydro is Niagara Falls. Hydro does not count for clean energy standard or renewable portfolio standard because it's so old and not in New England and um, a couple other things. So that's why Belmont was at 9% renewable portfolio standard qualifying. Um, we, for the purposes of our report in the glossary, define renewable as qualifying for the renewable portfolio standard. So some best practices that we found. Um, these are the really simple things that if you're from a municipal light plant town or even outside of one, the, the light plants can do that would both bring up their score and make a big impact on climate and bring us kind of to a, a minimum standard. I mean, meeting the renewable portfolio standard is a best practice. So 2012, it was 12%. I mean, 2017, it was 12%. Currently, in 2019, it is at least 14% and will be going up um, an additional 2% a year. Um, retiring RECs. So we gave points for retiring any amount of RECs retiring all of your RECs so that you can meet the Renewable Portfolio Standard or get closer to it is really the best practice. Um, and then and adding non-emitting energy to the, port, the energy supply um, steadily and increasing it is, is also important. So um, we did 35% non-emitting energy in our scoring system. Transparency, this should be easy points for all of the small towns who think doing well on climate um, is too expensive. Um, the town can make a climate or clean energy plan. The municipal light plant can itself adopt a clean energy goal with a greenhouse gas reduction or clean energy, renewable energy as a percentage of load. Um, goals that are accountable to their uh, reporting agency, whether that's the town manager, board of selectmen. And then just improving um, access to information. So we have this primarily on the website, um, but we also had points for doing community forums or community surveys, other ways for smaller munis to make sure they're getting input from their customers um, and providing information to customers. Because a lot of times you might hear a manager say, well, customers only care about one thing and that's rates and reliability. And then we'd say, well, have you asked them if they care about renewable energy or climate change? And often that answer is no. So asking them and actually making themselves open to what customers might want um, is important. Um, yeah, and we, we really did see that towns 
light plants who had heard from their customers that renewable energy was important um, did better on, it, on, on renewable energy issues. Dirty energy is, um, this is, really means reduction in dirty energy. So using storage, planning for storage, getting energy storage because municipal light plants have that small size and they can do the utility scale storage is really unique and exciting and also helps um, get off of gas peaker plants. So planning to retire any in-town gas peakers, also planning to replace long-term nuclear contracts and um, gas and oil contracts. Having that in writing is important because what happens if you don't have a plan and your contract expires, um, yeah, likely you're going to go for the easiest, cheapest thing and don't really know what will be out there. Um, additionally, and I will give this example with Wakefield, if the municipal light plant, there's only four of them that provide gas heating service to customers. We didn't score this because only four of them do it, but making... Um, a plan to manage the gas queue and educate consumers with information on heating electrification is really important because we can't be expanding gas heating service just because a municipal light plant provides gas heating service. Um, so I wanted to go over a few of the highlights. These are these are the the part if you go back to our goals and remember. We're looking for examples for municipal utilities to follow and for activists to use um, as a model. So many of you have probably heard about Belmont a lot. Um, they did really well in the transparency and leadership. They're transparent about the REX issue, um, reporting the same thing to the state as to their customers. And they have both a town climate action plan and then use that climate action plan to inform their own clean energy plan to voluntarily meet the clean energy standard, um, which means um, that I'm sure in 2018 and 2019, Belmont's renewable energy will be much higher. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, Holyoke was... I was excited about this one. It was interesting because it wasn't widely publicized. Um, not quite sure why. So Holyoke usually gets a lot of credit for their, their hydro. So they had the highest clean energy score because they have so much local hydro in town. And that's, you, you know, unique to the geography of Holyoke. Um, not a lot of that hydro is RPS qualified, which is why they also didn't meet the renewable portfolio standard, but a significant portion of it is, and they will supposedly be retiring those wrecks soon, is what they told me. So when they do that, then they could potentially meet the standard, which is great. But the exciting thing for me was they provided an example of an energy efficiency policy and tracking plan um, when I was talking about the lack of effective energy efficiency programs, we didn't even score on this part, but the concept of a closure rate, which as far as we could tell besides Holyoke, um, was not being tracked by any of the other municipal light plants. A closure rate is when an energy audit is done in your house, somebody should track out of all of the recommendations recommended to the customer, which ones were actually um, taken up. Like if they told you you should get insulation, did you get insulation? Were there rebates used from the municipal light plant for that insulation, et cetera. That's a major um, metric that the investor-owned utilities in the Mass Save program, which is like, one of our, it, we're, we're ranked number one in the country on the Mass Aid Program for Energy Efficiency. That's a major thing that they are measured on. And additionally, kilowatt hour savings is a big thing that people are measured on. A lot of municipal light plants weren't tracking that. We did get that information. Um, but it's really, 
not helpful for increasing a program or improving a program if nobody is tracking the data and knows what's going on. Um, so Holyoke had a highly detailed written plan that was done with support from MWEC, the Industry Association. So we like that example because it shows that it is possible and the Industry Association can help your light plant to create one of those. Um, Wakefield, as I said before, I they they also didn't they didn't get scored for this um, because of, of the the rubric, but they did have really cool things. They were the only one I found that had a light board that created climate or clean energy related goals for their manager um, directly from the light board. So these are like performance goals, and part of that was managing the gas queue and really encouraging, um, yeah, electrification. Uh, I got an email about, about the gas providing utility issue. Um, that'd be a great study for other people to do or for us to do at a different point. And Concord, you might have heard about them a lot. Um, if you've been paying attention to Muni's, they they scored really well on the leadership and transparency because they have an ambitious clean energy plan. Um, they will hopefully, if this was done in 2019, which we hope to do, um, they would be at 100% class one renewable energy from Massachusetts, qualifying for the Massachusetts Renewable Portfolio Standard. And they have a comprehensive plan to work on installing more renewables, get storage, um, do time of use rates, et cetera. Um, a lot of the, the, the high-performing unis were mostly the results of grassroots efforts. So if you go to our webpage, bit.ly forward slash MLP report, um, you can find there are three resource folders on Concord, Belmont, and Hingham. Um, they have the most, most of the grassroots materials on getting more renewable energy and clean energy plans. Um, if you are interested in the Wakefield example, Jennifer Kelly will be on later to talk briefly, and you can email me for more information on that, and I will check with her and see if she's, if she's open to hearing from you all. Um, relevant issues, so I won't spend too long on this, but if you are interested in state legislation, um, there are two bills right now that are updating our goals closer to what is necessary to stop climate change. Um, and they include municipal light plans in them. And then we'll, we'll have a, a webinar on our legislative agenda in March um, that you can join and I can explain more. There's one bill that is not very helpful to getting municipal light plants really on board and moving with positive momentum. Um, and this February the 11th, we will be dropping off our report, two pagers and a couple of the bigger reports at the State House to every single legislator there. If you would like to drop into your reps or senator's office, um, you can join us and deliver it yourself. Um, please contact me. Oh, this is a slight, I have a typo on this. It's Oriana Riley at MassClarinAction.net, not an I. I'll edit that before I send it out. Would be love to see you there this Monday at 10 a.m. Contact me for more information. So I will shortly pass this off, but how can you use this report locally? Um, this is a really important part. We did this for the activists, and we want it to be useful, um, yeah, for moving, making positive change. Um, so we would generally, I would just say, go to your light board meeting, bring this report with you, ask them and your plant manager questions that come up for you in this report, write a letter to the editor. If you'd like to do that, please contact me if you um, need any help, and let me know if you do write one. And follow other town models and connect with other activists. We'll, we have um, a robust program of um, 
of, of activists. We have a network. We have Muni Summits. Um, all right. So now let me turn this over to, we will start with Jennifer Palais from Wakefield. She is a light board member of the Wakefield Municipal Gas and Light Department. Jennifer, are you on for us? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. I think that means everyone else can too. Thanks, Jen. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you tonight. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm a commissioner on uh, Wakefield Electric and for uh, Wakefield Municipal Electric Gas and, U and uh, Light Utility. I was a yep. Um, I work as an energy consultant by day. I do a lot of focus on long-term energy planning for states and communities, and I'm now honored to be a public servant and to volunteer my time to help my community. I do want to state that my board hasn't yet had the opportunity to discuss this report at a board meeting, so my comments tonight are my own. They don't reflect those of my fellow commissioners, my utility manager, or other community leaders. Um, so I want to start by thanking MCAN for pulling together the data represented in this report. It is really data as commissioners, and I, I think it's helpful for utility managers as well to see. I think it's also helpful for citizens in these communities. Um, I can say that um, realize, knowing what I know about how much time it took to, to pull some of this together, it really would have exceeded the resources of communities, utilities, and their boards to do it. So we're very thankful to have MCAN um, who took the lead on this. And I also want to acknowledge that something that um, Oriana did point out, which is that there's really a variety of municipalities represented in this report. And while we all get our, our energy from municipal light plants, we're each unique. Um, we range a lot in terms of population, uh, whether we're urban or rural, the kind of resources we have available to us, um, economic, demographic. Some of us have gas and others don't. So there's a range of communities in this uh, group. Um, and I want to point out, too, the, something that Oriana said, which is the benefit of being a municipal utility, and I really do believe that there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, what we like about our municipal utility is that they are our neighbor. Um, it's a small geographic scale. Um, we can walk down the street uh, to visit buildings and towns and various things. Um, there's an ability to really respond quickly, connect in person, and provide really customized solutions that um, are, are a good fit for our many and unique needs and challenges. Um, so what the report does, I don't want to go into too much detail. I think, Oriana, you hit on many of these things. But it really identifies what matters in a world where carbon reductions are important and discusses why. It also points out that there are some key themes and opportunities for improvement that are broadly applicable. across. So even though these communities are unique, um, there are definitely some themes that cross um, all of them. It provides a standardized and transparent framework for assessing performance. So we can clearly see, um, you know, if you wanted to, the score you'll receive if you take certain actions. And as a result, it's pretty easy to develop a roadmap from this and see what you'll get from your efforts. But I think the most important out outcome, and this is one thing, as I've been attending some of the meetings that Oriana referred to, um, is really the ability to see what everyone is doing and reach out to others for more information. Um, what I realized in looking at this report card is that everybody's been doing different things and pursuing different opportunities. Um, and we're really in a trial and learn mode, so this is pretty important. There's no need for each community to kind of start from scratch or reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good learning out there that we can build from. So getting into opportunities for improvement, I've got a few. Uh, when I look at this, I, I definitely see some quick wins that can be implemented right away. Um, I think that there, however, I, I do want to say like you, that I don't think we'll see kind of cookie cutter approaches. You know, with the IOUs, you see programs that cross, that are the same essentially for all the different communities in their service territory. I think here you'll see some customization. You know, you'll see different policies, program designs, and practices, and I think this is totally okay and makes sense. So um, I fully expect that. The second opportunity I see is to really expand um, uh, performance metrics and goals from the current focus on rates and reliability. And those are certainly foundational metrics and important, 
But uh, I'll give two examples where I think we could start to think more broadly. So one is expanding the purview from rates to bills. This really starts to bring in the impact of energy efficiency on customer costs and, and all, the, all the different benefits that comes from doing those efforts. And the other area is really thinking about um, energy costs uh, fully. So thinking about the cost of transitioning from fossil fuels, for example, for heating and transportation, and starting to capture those in our analysis a bit better. And then I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we should really start to capture things, um, success metrics associated with leadership and innovation, better communication and customer service in some of our um, performance metrics and goals. Thirdly, I think it's really important over the longer term to do more strategic planning. And this really helps us kind of consider and weigh more uh, transformative changes over the longer term. And, and there will need to be some as we um, go down this path. Critical on that is to engage, I think, citizens in the community um, and also town government in these kind of discussions. And that really is just to ensure that the plan and solutions work for the utilities, but also work for citizens and, and the municipality as well. Fourth, I see that I, I definitely notice communities that are rising to the top. Um, and, and some of this is a result of the fact that they have um, great communities that have established climate goals, and that's really driving municipal utility action. And it makes sense. Um, but I wonder if there isn't another approach that would work well, too. Um, and I'm wondering if there's an approach where the municipal utility can be the leader in this space and convene stakeholders in the community around some of these issues. So I'd, I'd like to encourage it as an alternative approach, and I, I really do look forward to seeing more of that in the coming years. And lastly, I just want to make sure that we really appreciate a test and learn approach. I think we're in a transition period. Some things, um, some programs and designs might not work quite out, might not work out quite as planned, but I think it's pretty easy to adjust and, um, you know, get some learning and, and move forward. So um, just to summarize, I think the report card provides a really good picture of where we are today. And I think when we replicate this two years from now, I'm really enthusiastic about the potential to see some really big shifts here. I'm excited that there are a lot of opportunities that lie ahead of us and um, for the opportunity to work together as communities to improve the lives of people and our communities. And I think we all share that interest in goals. So thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to questions. I have some more specific ideas, but just kind of wanted to lay out a few um, overarching thoughts right now. Thanks so much. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brian from Rowley, who's going to um, give his thoughts as well. And Oriana, do you want to introduce Brian? Sure. I'll just really quickly say Brian de Persia um, has been attending our Municipal Light Plan Summits for the past year, and he was recently just joined the Light Board the, a couple nights ago. Um, so, yeah, you could share how you're going to use this in your town, Brian. Yes. Thank you, Oriana. Are you able to hear me all right? I think you're good. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so as you stated, um, I, I've been involved with the, with MCAN for the last year or so, and uh, also uh, with my local uh, municipal light plant um, board meetings and uh, uh, just uh, was recently here uh, appointed fulfilling a, a retirement on the board. So um, I'm excited to get into uh, activities being a board member and participating uh, from, from that side of the table. Um, generally uh, hit everything that uh, is of, of great importance in this report. Uh, so much effort was put into uh, assembling this data and making uh, a meaningful tool that uh, not only members of the communities can use, but uh, management, uh, board, uh, board members themselves uh, can all uh, get behind and try to have a, a structure and, a, and an approach to, to make to bring meaningful change change to the light uh, light departments. Um, it's if you look at the you look at the tool uh, look at the report as a tool. Uh, I think in my mind, and uh, it's uh, you kind of look at it from a, a bird's eye view, and uh, you'd like to do everything all at once. And uh, obviously, that that's not a a feasible approach. So. You do need to have some level of strategy, uh, kind of uh, looking at it and seeing. Uh, you know, everybody would would love to meet the RPS or have all 
class one recs um, for their portfolios. But uh, kind of the, the approach would be really to look at it and say, what are some of the easiest, uh, quickest points of improvement that could be done by some very simple actions, uh, you know, kind of looking for your best bang for the buck on, on returns. Um, I think looking at, uh, looking at my town and my uh, light department, um, I can very easily look and see that, uh, I think, looking to increase like, levels of rebates, um, promote, uh, promotion of some of the uh, some programs that we have in town. Uh, it's really kind of getting out there and, and getting uh, the community involved in the light department because it really is such a critical aspect of a, of a town. Uh, everybody needs power. Uh, everybody wants reliable power and they want uh, cheap power, but uh, – also, people want clean power, and sometimes uh, it's just not known by the light department if that's, uh, if that's what people really want. So communication and understanding uh, the community and the customers is really uh, really an aspect that this report card can, can bring forth. So uh, you know, trying to get uh, establishing uh, clear and uh, concise goals for the managers um, and then uh, – Increasing really that that public awareness in uh, both participation at light board meetings and uh, at community events, and uh, some other easy things to do might be uh, making sure that websites um, are up to date with with information and reports. Um, oh, I, I think uh, throughout this report card, there um, there are lots of uh, lower scores on the transparency and leadership side, and some of that may go into. Uh, just not having available uh, information on a on a light plant's uh, website, or maybe they don't uh, may not reach out as much to the community via uh, many avenues we have now, such as social media or, or Twitter, things like that, uh, where uh, they can very easily get the word out on a new program uh, to the community instead of uh, um, you know maybe a simple posted uh, note in town hall or something like that. So it's uh, it's really about getting that that community engagement. And like Jen said, uh, understanding uh, the community and and uh, if you need to have a survey, you know, it's uh, that, that's a valuable tool to have as well, so you can understand really, really what your customers want. Um, you know, it gets really back down to that. The municipal light plants are run by the people. It's people power, so it's uh, it really if, if the community wants to have change and wants to have initiatives and put in place, it, it really comes down to uh, community participation and the, the people of the community coming together and, and asking the questions. Um, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't urge people to take this report card and, and you know, put it down on the light board's table and say, you know, explain this. Uh, I think it's, it's obviously uh, requires a, a more strategic uh, approach and, and, uh, uh, a conversation uh, to really understand uh, not only the light department's uh, current mode of operation, but but then maybe what what they may have in plans for the future that uh, that community could be uh, a part of. So I, I'm excited, like I said, to to, to be a part of of the rally uh, uh, light department, and uh, I look forward to. Uh, seeing how I can just use this report card uh, for my community. Awesome. Turn back thank over you. to Oriana. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you as well, Jennifer. Um, we are running close to the end. I apologize for speaking a little bit longer than I intended. Um, I haven't seen too many questions. If people have questions, could you please Type them into the chat box. So while we wait for questions, um, this is Jen again. So uh, there are a few uh -huh. things, Brian, you said that I would absolutely love to just quickly mm -hmm. comment on. One is there's a lot of excitement about solar and electric vehicles these days, and I would just reiterate the need to really double down on energy efficiency. Um, this is really the least cost uh, supply that we have in many cases, um, and so making sure we use our energy as efficient as possible not only is going to lower costs, but it's also going to, if necessary, I would say, in order to achieve our climate goals. Um, 
So I just wanted to mention that, and uh, thanks for raising that, Brian. It's important. Yes, good point. Um, all right, so we have one. Huh. All right, so we have one question so far. Um, this question is, can you speak to the pros and cons of CPA versus an MLP, in other words, timing and ability to achieve renewable energy goals? Um, I can answer that briefly and then hear the two of you's perspective as well. So um, at MCAN, we do help communities do CCA, which is community choice aggregation, which is only possible in an investor-owned utility territory. Um, timing and ability to achieve renewable energy goals as far as percentage of electricity provided, I would say they're actually pretty similar. Um, both of them take, it depends on your, really depend on the political aspects of your town. Community choice, if, here. so if you, have, if you have the ideal situation in your municipal light plant and all you had to do was go to your municipal light plant and say, we want 5% more renewable energy. If your muni, um, manager wants to do that, and if they have generation that they've been selling the RECs for, it's really it would be faster. It would be faster than an aggregation program because they can just pretty much do it immediately. Um, if they have to go out and purchase RECs or energy generation and the and the RECs, it might take to the end of the year a couple months, which would be a similar time as the um, as a community choice aggregation, if you're in a town trying to do a community choice aggregation um, with with an additionally the most sympathetic decision maker, um, you could probably get it into the Department of Public Utilities for review within three three months. Um, and then it can get stuck in the Department of Public Utilities for like six months to a year. So because of that bureaucracy, it could take a little bit longer. Um, but I would say they're relatively similar. They both take some organizing. They both have um, similar bang for your buck. If you're in a municipal light plant town and you've wondered, oh, I can't do an aggregation, but you wanted to do that, it would be the same as retiring your rec. Um, or if they're already you know, retired, which they most likely aren't, then figuring out how to purchase more and purchase more generation and keep the recs with that purchase. Um, do either of you have thoughts on on that? Um, this is John. I mean, the only thing I would add is, you know, I see the opportunity for MLPs as being billed locally. So um, it's, got to, it's a lot easier. You know your zoning board. You know your laws. You know you know where the spaces are, and you can connect with the government. You know your local government. So um, you know we're already aggregated. We can certainly make purchase decisions. But I think that building locally and in town, um, both from a behind and in front of the meter standpoint, is an opportunity. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh -huh. um, all right, I think we have another another question is was Cape Light Compact included, and how would they compare? So Cape Light Compact was not included because they are not a municipal utility. Um, they are more like a community aggregation program. Um, I would, yeah, I honestly wouldn't know. Um, how Cape Light would would compare. Um, Carol and M. Ken might know a little bit more about what Cape Light is doing. And the other question, or do either of you know much about Cape Light? Yeah. Um, this is Jen. Uh, this is Jen. I know. I know quite a bit. I mean, one thing I can say about Cape Light is that. You know, they are, I think, you know, and you certainly put your utilities up here, 
Um, so they are an aggregator for energy efficiency services on the Cape. And so if you were to add them to your um, energy efficiency slide, they have always been very innovative in that regard and very out front. They have an excellent suite of programs. Um, and they're really starting to uh, transition some of the, those programs, I think, in the current three-year plan to start to include things like actually renewables, um, so solar, okay. electric vehicles, and um, all kinds of other uh, equipment underneath the category of energy efficiency. So it's, it's something to watch, and, and it is exciting. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good point. I think it would have been, it would have been interesting to include include them in the comparison to the uh, other utilities. I didn't have a chance to look into it. Um, one other question that we have is, so the question is, given that we have to transition, we have to electrify, um, transition to heat pumps and electric vehicles, it's also important to keep electricity not only clean, but also inexpensive. Um, why don't we take that parameter into account and give some points instead of zero? Um, I would, so, I would say there's a couple of things. <laughs> we, we were really focusing on climate and clean energy. I would say EVs, electric vehicles, Actually, instead of keeping rates low, more important is the time of use rate. So um, we've we've had a couple of lectures at our events talking about electric beneficial electrification. Um, we actually don't want electric rates to be super low for EVs because then our grid, the local grid, would go kind of out. If people are just plugging in at 5 p.m. because it's really cheap, then that would ruin the peak load issues. I'm sure the two of you can talk a little bit more about that um, with your local knowledge and energy energy backgrounds. Um, so I would argue that low rates aren't important. It's actually time of use rates are more important and um, the chargers that can kind of turn on and off. And we didn't get to look into time of use rates. Um, we were really interested in that. We had to pare down the number of things we were looking at, and we saw time of use rates as um, more of the, like, next step innovation, and nobody that we came across did have a, a town-wide time of use rate. There were, like, two or three voluntary time of use rate things that, um, yeah, we just, we had to keep it kind of to, like, this is kind of the, what's the word, like, the minimum baseline that people should be at, and time of use rates are important. And we hope to see that as innovation going forward. Um, as far as giving points for um, rates, I mean, Muni's already, we already know Muni's have low rates. Um, it just, it doesn't, it didn't seem to be part of the climate solution. If, if the reasoning for low rates is that they don't want to use renewable energy, um, it just felt um, counter counterproductive to emphasize that we yeah there are plenty of things you need to do well um, that aren't related to climate and clean energy and we weren't focusing on that in this report and then do the two of you have ideas about the electrification and rates issue Um, so this is Jen. I have, I have two points I can make on that. One for renewables is that costs are changing dramatically. Um, and I think we just saw, you know, offshore wind coming in super low, way below what anybody ever envisioned um, and below some of the cost of other uh, supply resources that we have for New England. So um, it's changing rapidly. Uh, I wouldn't uh, pin it to something from last year or the year before because it's really in flux and it's getting better and better all the time. Uh, the other piece is, you know, we don't have a metric in this report. It's something to consider about the interplay between what customers mm -hmm. can save in energy efficiency and what if there is a small incremental uh, rate increase for some renewables and, and what the net net of that is. Um, but my guess is that for deep energy efficiency, uh, the overall bill will be lower. And I've seen that in a number of places that the impact of saving energy um, in many cases would 
uh, completely offset the, any uh, or some of the incremental needed for renewables, at least today. And then the future is, you know, something to keep in mind. Yeah, Jennifer, I'm so glad you mentioned that. We were hoping to get a study on that done um, by a partner organization in the near future. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, that's, that was definitely something we would love to look into in the future, and we were not able to do this time. Yeah, this is Brian. I would echo what Jen said as well. It's energy efficiency and uh, cost go hand in hand. So if it's if there's an ability to reduce consumption, then, uh, you know, you're going to have lean towards a, a lower energy bill. Now, it may not affect the rate, but uh, there are other factors in that that could help to uh, lower a rate, such as the time of use and, and peak rate shaving, things like that. So um, as Oriana mentioned, it's, there's a couple of different facets in there that, that can affect what would be considered a rate. But surely it, it's definitely something valuable to look at um, in yeah, the future. And that's a good point. And, um, Brian, you make me think, too, of the fact that, um, you know, if you're, t if you're to also think about transportation costs and your transportation energy costs I included in this whole pie, and you switch to um, an electric vehicle, the cost will be lower. So your energy costs are going down then for your transportation as well. So broadening out that picture um, really helps you see that some of these big transition points, net-net, uh, you're going to be better off. Fantastic. Um, that is the last question we have, and we are 10 minutes past 8, so I'm going to close us off there. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this call. Thank you so much to Brian and Jennifer. Um, if you have questions, you can email me. Um, I can connect you with all, uh, all of the resources we talked about, and I can connect you with Jennifer and Brian. I'm sure they would be happy to talk to people in munis. Um, you can find the report at bit.ly forward slash capital MLP report card. That's the full report link. You can find that link as well as many other resources in our simplified two-pager at bit.ly forward slash MLP report. And... Um, yeah, I'm so glad to have been on this webinar with all of you, and have a good night, everyone. Goodbye.